Previously on Radio Cataclysm, Zek was in the right place at the wrong time when he ran afoul of Imperial Law Keepers, along with every other patron of the Blue Coal Tavern. Which is the greater crime? Drawing an acoustic laser on an adder cop? Or neglecting to pay his bar tab? It's almost like he was trying to get arrested. The paddy wagon rattled like a sack of bones. Two great robot horses pulled it across the barren land. The spotter sat up top in a perch that afforded him a view of the landscape in all directions. The guards sat in a covered cab at the front of the wagon, behind the horses. The back of the wagon was cramped, with just enough room for a bench on each side and space to walk single file. The only door was located at the rear, locked and heavily armored. There were no windows, only a small vent for climate control. The guards had sprayed each prisoner with a compound that dissolved the webs that encased them. They then applied spider silk shackles around the prisoners' wrists and ankles, with additional strands tying them to the benches. Before closing and locking the door, each captive was notified of the charges against them by the taller of the two guards. She started with the teenagers. Stephen Broyle, you are charged with truancy illegal possession of a controlled substance, and consumption of a controlled substance. Matthew Carey, you are charged with truancy, illegal possession of a controlled substance, and consumption of a controlled substance. And damaging the uniform of an imperial guard, said the shorter guard. It's puke, it'll wash out, the tall one replied. She moved on to Zek. Zek Strauss, you are charged with theft of goods or services, an attempted assault on an officer of the peace. The guard turned around and regarded the giant, still out cold from the debilitator. Even sitting, he came face to face with the guard. He took up a good half of the bench, requiring his friend and the wizard to squeeze together on the other half. Meet Rom, the guard said. You will be informed of the charges against you now and again when you have regained consciousness. You are charged with theft of state secrets, theft of government property, possession of restricted military-grade weaponry, evasion of justice, destruction of property both public and private, three counts of murder, 59 counts of assault, and attempted assault on an officer of the peace. I'm impressed you got that out all in one breath, Zek said. The guard ignored him and moved on to the man who'd been studying the map with the giant. Bert's Foth. You are charged with theft of state secrets, theft of government property, possession of restricted military-grade weaponry, evasion of justice, destruction of property both public and private, arson, pickpocketing, nine counts of murder, seventeen counts of assault, attempted assault on an officer of the peace, attempted theft from an officer of the peace, and littering. The wizard was last. If I guess the charges, will you let me off with a warning? He said. No, said the guard without humor but a plea of guilty would be taken into consideration upon your trial. John Derman, you are charged with assaulting an officer of the peace. That's it, John said. After the laundry list you read these two guys, all I get is assault with a not-so-deadly snake? It's enough, the guard said. Addressing the entire van load, she said, All accused are considered neither innocent nor guilty until proven either way at the Ruby Court. This paddy wagon will make stops every four hours for meals and regular bodily functions. This vehicle is not equipped with an emergency call button, but if you have a bodily waste emergency, stomp your feet three times fast, then two more times. We will allow you an additional break. Do not abuse this privilege. These horses are fast, but we have a long way to go. We will be traversing the eastern hinterlands, which means there is nowhere to run if you try to escape. Are there any final words before we embark? Addercop, said Stephen. The guard shut the door. The first few hours passed in silence. Zek tugged impatiently at the webbing that bound his wrists. The paddy wagon rocked and swayed with every dip and bump in the road, knocking the prisoners against each other. Meet Rom slept away. He didn't wake even when his head lolled with the motion of the van smacking against the ceiling before falling forward or to the side to rest against Bert's. He just snored and drooled on himself. Finally, Zek couldn't stand the awkward silence any longer. 
Well, we know each other's names and alleged crimes, but we haven't been properly introduced. It's a long way to the ruby court. We might as well get to know each other. Only John, the old mage, looked at Zek. Then he sneered and looked away again. Zek continued, undeterred. I was born at sea in a boat made of cabbage, man without a country. I've lived here and there, New York, Dayton, Lexington, Centralia most recently. I was only passing through Rittenberg on my way to Chattanooga. I'm a dabbler and a dilettante, much to the chagrin of my mother and father. Oh, well, I thought you were a corsair. You dress like one, muttered Stephen, the boy who hadn't thrown up in the bar. He spoke with an accent that had come to be known as Kentucky Cockney, a little bit of each, but not really either, a result of one of the geographical jigsaw puzzles the Empire had created. It might behoove you not to make assumptions about people based on their attire, said Zek. Looking at you and your green about the gills friend and your t-shirts and jeans, I might be inclined to assume that I was in the presence of a pair of gutter snipes. The boy said nothing to that, only spat at Zek's shoe. He missed. What about you, old man? Zek asked John. What's your story? I must say, that was some interesting wizardry back in the bar. The old wizard muttered something under his breath. Uh, I'm a snake mage. I'm trained in the subtle art of snake magics. Uh, herpomancy, that is. Herpomancy, huh? Bert said. Do you think you could summon something with nice pointy teeth? Something that could tear through these shackles? Bert's had not witnessed the incident with the garter snake, having been encased in webbing at the time. Uh, they took my staff, John said. No use. Too bad. If I could only get some good leverage, I could tear right through this silk. He twisted his wrists and flexed and pulled, but to no avail. Flipping cops. And what about the teenage tobacco enthusiasts sitting to my right? Said Zek. What brings two young scholars such as yourselves to a shady tavern in the middle of a school day, gulping smoke like water? Mind your own business, Corsair, said Stephen. I assure you, despite my attire, I am not a pirate nor a privateer. To be perfectly honest, these aren't even my clothes. <laughs> it's a funny story. Due to a misunderstanding with a customs agent upon my return to Pennsylvania from New Belgium, I found myself running through the airport completely nude. All I had was my carry-on bag, which was of little help as all of my clothes were in my checked luggage. In my haste to address the issue of my nudity, I mistook a complete stranger's suitcase for my own at the baggage carousel. These clothes were the first things I pulled out, so I threw them on. I fully intended to turn back and apologize to those customs agents for the mix-up, but I inadvertently activated a one-time teleport sphere that happened to be in the pocket of these trousers. I meant to acquire some suitable attire once I arrived in Kentucky, but my credit card seems to have been frozen, and what cash I have on hand is needed for food and lodging. I'm sure there's an equally innocent explanation for your truancy, as well as your indecorous behavior. I said, mind your own business, said the boy. Don't bother me with yours. The awkward silence returned. After a minute, it was broken again by a pitiful voice, barely louder than a whisper. My name's Matthew, said the boy who had vomited onto the guard's boots. Does anybody have a mint? His accent was a little more Kentucky and a little less Cockney, suggesting he and Stephen came from opposite ends of Rintberg. I do, said Zek. There's a small tin of mints in my satchel. Unfortunately, it's in the cargo hatch with the rest of our belongings. Matthew looked like he was on the verge of vomiting again. The road was particularly wavy here, and the wagon tossed like a ship at sea. A little tempest in the tummy, eh? said Zek. I find it helps if I close my eyes... Try not to think about all the lurching and swaying. Don't think about the dryness in your throat or the swimmy sensation in your head. You're a sir, said Stephen. Just take deep breaths, Matthew. Think of your mum. What on earth possessed you to smoke half a pack of cigarettes in one sitting anyway, said Zek. We were trying to, Matthew began. I told you to mind your own business, said Stephen. Why don't you smoke my dick, Corsair? Zek was on the verge of spitting the perfect retort when a jolt from below sent the wagon several feet up into the air. There was a giddy moment of weightlessness before the wagon went crashing back down with a tremendous crack. The robot horses whinnied, and the vehicle jolted to a stop. The restraints holding Meat Rom to the bench snapped, and he tumbled forward. 
His head slammed Zack in the gut, knocking the wind out of him and dislodging one of his dental caps. The cap landed on the now vacant seat next to Bert's. Meat slid to the floor between the benches. Bert's twisted awkwardly in his seat and managed to pick up the dental cap with his thumb and forefinger. Ugh, that was in his mouth, you know, said John. Bert's paid him no mind. Titanium, is it? Bert's said. Zack nodded. The dental cap had an edge just sharp enough to cut through the protein strands of the spider webs. With a few swift motions, Bert's sliced through all of his restraints. He sawed through Meat's shackles next, then Zack's. Within seconds, he had freed the mage and the two youths as well. Thanks, he said, and handed the cap back to Zack. Then he shoved one arm under Meat and hoisted him over his shoulder like a sack of feathers. With one kick, he sent the rear door of the wagon flying. He jumped out and placed Meat in a sitting position against the side of the wagon. Zek popped the cap back in place. He put his hand out to shield his eyes from the orange light streaming into the wagon. The sun was setting back where they'd come from, shrouded in the ever-present volcanic ash that clouded the atmosphere. Besides the sinking sun, all Zek could see was hardened lava, black and wrinkled, as far as the horizon. It rolled and fell in great hills and valleys, a country of stone. The two youths jumped down beside Bert's and Meat, with John and Zack right behind. I don't like this, said a voice from the side of the wagon. It was the taller of the guards. There's too many hills and ditches here, too many places to hide. Jim? said another voice. It was the short guard. Jim, can you hear me? Jim! Captain Taymor, I think Jim's broken his neck. Well, he fell on his head, so I'd say it's likely said the taller guard. What do we do? It's Jim. He's dead. And his rifle's broken. The stock split right in half. Focus, Captain Jot. I need you to not be in shock right now. There's nothing we can do for him. And right now, I'm more worried about two things. The prisoners escaping from the van, and more importantly, finding out who placed the derailleur mine we just hit. The short guard spun around at the mention of the prisoners escaping. Prisoners, he said. He drew his spider gun and strode to the back of the wagon. Back in the van, now! As your partner said, I think you have more pressing issues to worry about, said Bertz. If that wasn't mine, that means we're under attack. Could be ravagers, could be scrappers, could be something else, but I'd say it's only a matter of seconds before whoever set the trap comes to see what they've caught. You think I'm an idiot? We hit a pothole, that's all. I order you to return to your seat while we conduct repairs. As if in reply, the three tires on the port side of the vehicle burst, popping sounds accompanied concurrently by the telltale pew-pew-pew of a laser gun. The three tires on the starboard side went next. Everybody spun to see where the shots had come from. The reddened light of the setting sun shone off the polished armor of a dozen soldiers, surrounding the wagon like hours on a clock. Their helmets looked like eggs with dark faceplates, their laser rifles had bayonet-like points. The grips were shaped like axe heads. Like the Imperial Guards, they were covered in armor from head to toe, but the design was completely foreign to most of the travelers. Only the guard known as Captain Tamor seemed to recognize them. Arterian Numa, she said, and raised her blunderbuss. Captain Jod only had his spider gun, but he raised it all the same. A voice like robot thunder filled the air, seemingly coming from all twelve Numa soldiers in concert. We prefer to take the target alive. Discard your weapons and kiss dirt, and you all may live. What about Jim? shouted Jot. There was a pause. Who the hell is Jim? said the voice. Our spotter! He fell out of the shotgun seat and broke his neck. Another pause. Do as we say, and all of you, except for Jim, may live. Saw this, said Stephen. He grabbed Matthew and helped him back into the wagon. What do you want from us? asked Captain Tamor. We only want the one called Meat Rom. You will give him, or we will take him. It makes little difference to us. Oh, you want Meat Rom? said Bertz. This guy? He pointed at the sleeping giant. Yes, said the voice. All right, then, said Bertz. Here you go. He took Meat Rom by the hands, spun around twice, and flung Meat's limp body at one of the Numa. The giant flew fast, spinning like a shuriken. 
His boots hit the soldier in the side, sending him flying into the soldier to his right with the force of a speeding bus. A crunch and a crack were followed by plumes of purple smoke erupting from each of the soldiers. Their armored suits collapsed to the ground like deflated balloons. Losing no momentum after tossing meat, Bertz raised his leg and kicked a sizable dent next to the starboard cargo hatch, forming a crevice next to the door. He reached into the crevice and tore the door straight off. John, he said, tossing the snake mage his staff. John grabbed at the staff and missed. It clattered to the ground. Zek! He tossed Zek his satchel. He caught it and rummaged until he found his acoustic laser. Everything happened very fast then. The remaining soldiers opened fire with their laser rifles. One shot whizzed right over John's head, missing him only because he'd stooped to pick up his staff. Zek used the orphaned door from the cargo hatch to shield himself and John. Laser shots pinged off of the door. All right, said John. Leave this to me. It always transpires that a wizard has to step in and pull everyone's nuts out of the fire. He stepped out from behind the door shield and raised his staff. A few laser shots came his way, but they all turned black and vanished before they reached him. The gem on the end of his staff shone in the sunlight, brighter than it should have. The glow turned from orange to an unnatural blue. Zek thought he saw an eye in that blue light, a pupil with a vertical slit that split the world. Serpent rain! John shouted. The sun blinked, just for a moment. A crack of thunder rumbled, but it followed no lightning. Over the heads of each of the Numa soldiers, a dark portal flickered open. Three or four snakes tumbled out and landed on each guy. The portal snapped shut. What the? said the booming robot voice. The snakes fell to the ground and slithered away, but the distraction was just enough to give the prisoners and their guards the upper hand. Bert's ran in a zigzag pattern, quickly closing in on one of the Numa, he grabbed the soldier's laser rifle right out of his hands and hit him in the faceplate with the axe-shaped butt. The glass-like material cracked but didn't shatter. The soldier swung at Bert's, but Bert's was too fast. He ducked, swept his leg in an arc, and sent his opponent to the ground flat on his back. He gave the soldier's faceplate another whack with the butt of the rifle. It cracked this time. Purple smoke screamed out like steam from a kettle. Bert's raised the rifle and tried to fire at another soldier, but the weapon was programmed to only fire in the living hands of its owner. Bert's threw the rifle like a javelin. The sharp point struck a soldier in the torso and penetrated his chest plate with a crunch. More purple smoke. The soldier flopped to the ground. Captain Tamor blasted one of the Numa right in the faceplate with a two-pound shot from her blunderbuss. A column of purple smoke erupted from the soldier's head. She wasted no time dispatching another one. Captain Jock got a few shots off with his spider gun. Only one hit, but it had the desired effect. The soldier dropped to the ground, wrapped in webs. The guard dove for cover with Zek and John. Retreat, he shouted, into the van. You really don't have to shout, said Zek. I mean, we're right here. Come on, said Jot. He grabbed one side of the door and Zek grabbed the other. They walked backwards with it and climbed up into the relative safety of the passenger area. They set the door from the cargo hatch in the gaping hole where the back door used to be. It only covered two-thirds of the hole, but it was better than nothing. Tamor saw that they'd taken out more than half of their attackers, nearly clearing a half-circle. She switched her blunderbuss to the spray setting and opened continuous fire in the direction of the two Numa that remained on her side of the wagon. The soldiers dove for cover in ditches. Tamor continued firing as she ran for the back of the van. Bert's arrived at the same time she did, shielding himself with the apparently empty suit of a fallen soldier. I don't have my blunderbuss, said the short guard. Where is it? said Tamor. In the cab. I didn't think I'd need it. Bert's nodded. May I borrow this? He took Zek's acoustic laser without waiting for a response. He leapt up and hoisted himself onto the top of the wagon. There was a muffled kaboom, followed by a sound like an egg cracking from the inside out. What the hell is that? They heard Bert say. His footsteps thudded across the roof of the wagon. Two soldiers appeared from behind a short hill about a hundred yards away, close enough to be dangerous. Captain Tamor sprayed suppressing fire in their direction. He'd better come back with that blunderbuss, she said. I'm running low on ammo here. I'm out of two-pound shot and these pellets aren't going to do much against that armor of theirs. This may help, 
said Zek. He pulled up his shirt and reached his thumb and forefinger into his navel. With a wet plop, he pulled out something that looked like a bright red cherry with a black stem. What the hell is that? said Stephen. It's an incendiary cherry bomb, said Zek. And you had it hidden in your belly button? No, of course not. It was manned by a synthetic stomach virus I contracted some time ago. I call it Borb, short for Borborygmus. That's disgusting, said Stephen. I'll take that, said Captain Jot. He plucked the cherry bomb from Zek's grasp. Do I light it, or what? You know, it would really be nice to have a chance to use one of my own weapons for once, said Zek. Another egg-cracking sound came from the fore of the wagon, followed by a shot from a blunderbuss. Zek sighed. <sighs> you don't light it. You pull the stem, then throw it as far as you can. Hold your fire a moment, said Captain Jot. Captain Tamor stopped firing. Jot stood up so he could lob the cherry bomb over the door shield. The Numa soldiers, assuming that Tamor was reloading, stood up and rushed toward the wagon. Jot pulled the stem and threw the cherry as hard as he could. It hit one of the soldiers square in the chest and burst on impact. Instead of an explosion, the cherry showered the Numa's ivory-colored suit with a sticky red fluid. The two soldiers stopped in surprise, looked down at the juice, then continued toward the wagon. Nothing more seemed to be happening. Captain Jot ducked back down behind the door. Is that cherry juice? Was that just an actual cherry? Oh, no, I assure you, it's a quite deadly bomb. Maybe it wasn't ripe? As ripe as they get, you'll see in a moment. Sure enough, a second later, and not more than fifty feet from the wagon, the cherry juice began to smoke. The Numa stopped again and tried unsuccessfully to wipe it off of his armor. The juice burst into flames, sending the soldier into a panic. He dropped to the ground and rolled around, but the flames only grew larger. The other soldier stomped on the flames in a futile attempt to put them out. Instead, the flames spread to his suit. He dropped to the ground too, rolling and flailing. Purple smoke began to leak from the seams and joints of their armor. The purple smoke joined with the fire, turning black and roaring like a lion. The soldiers may have screamed, or it may have just been the sound of the smoke escaping from their suits. Soon, they were still. The fire settled from a roar to a steady flicker. All that remained were the shells of their suits. That was upsetting, said Captain Jot. That armor is made from a dense carbon lattice, said Tamor. Once it starts burning, it'll keep going for hours. I think that's all of them, said Zek. Assuming Bert's got the rest of the ones up front with a blunderbuss and my acoustic laser, I think we're in the clear. Even assuming that there are no more of them, we are not in the clear, said Tamor. That was a nice distraction with the serpent rain, Derman. Oh, uh, yes, said John. That's exactly what it was supposed to be, a distraction. Not a feast for snakes or anything. Do you think you could do it again if you had to? Maybe with larger snakes that could eat something the size of a house cat? I'm pretty knackered, said John. Stuff like that really takes it out of me these days. Fair enough, said Tamor. We need to destroy the suits, then. Put them on the fire. We need to move quickly. She stashed her blunderbuss across her back and hopped down from the van. A cry of anguish came from the front of the wagon. Foth, said Tamor. John stayed in the van with Matthew and Stephen to rest, but Zek and Captain Jot followed Captain Tamor to the source of the noise. Bert's was under attack by three cat-sized robots with twenty legs each. Their legs went from rigid to bendy and back again, undulating like tentacles when they needed to crawl or climb, turning rigid as steel bars when they needed to run across the ground, or grasp something tightly like the one on Bert's leg. What the hell are those? said Captain Jot. Secondary tactical vehicles, ejected from the ivory suits, said Tamor as she sprinted. We just called them squids. One of the squids had attached itself to Bert's face. He made a fist and punched the thing, bowing his head forward at the same time. The robot shattered, legs flying in all directions. A whiff of purple smoke came out. Something the size and color of a naked mole rat fell out of the robot and plopped to the ground. They've got meat, Rom, said Bert's. The guns are in the cab. Don't bother with me. He stomped on a robot scuttling up on his left side. Its legs splayed out, then went limp. The one on his legs squeezed even tighter. 
There was a soft crack as his femur broke. He roared, but ignored the squid on his leg in favor of the one crawling up his back. Tamor turned and looked at the spot where she'd last seen meat Rom. The giant was no longer there. There, said Jot, pointing. They're carrying him off like ants. Sure enough, four of the squids were gradually hauling Meat's unconscious body across the ground. Where are they taking? Jot was cut short by a squid leaping from the ground onto the back of his head. Its legs wrapped all the way around and covered his face. Stay put, said Tamor. She ran to the cab of the wagon and searched for something under the seat. She returned a moment later with a tire iron and Zek's acoustic pistol. She handed the tire iron to Zek. Stick it between the thing and his head. Pry it off, then smash and smash it. Try not to breathe the purple smoke. I'll get Meat Rom. She paused. Be careful. She ran after Meat Rom's slowly retreating form. The squid wrapped its legs around Jot's head and squeezed. The chalicerae on his mask snapped off and fell away, exposing patches of skin underneath. Do something, he said. With his mouthpiece damaged, his real voice came through. He sounded young. He sounded scared. All right, hold still, said Zek. He wedged the tire iron between the many-legged thing and the back of the guard's helmet. He had to wiggle it and apply considerable pressure to shove it into place. On the count of three, I'm going to pry it loose, he said. One? He twisted the iron counterclockwise as hard as he could, popping several of the robot's legs out of their sockets. The squid flopped backwards, scrambling for purchase on the smooth back of the guard's uniform. Zek gave it a whack with the tire iron, which snapped it free of its last grip on Captain Jot. It landed on its back, missing a good third of its appendages, but it lost no time riding itself. It reared up on its remaining legs like an angry spider. Zek swung the iron like a golf club. The robot flew ten feet, grabbed at the ground to stop itself, then ran back at Zek with renewed vigor. Another squid, traveling at a considerable speed, crashed into it from the side, their legs tangled together in a tentacular hug, even as their bodies crushed and broke. Purple smoke leaked out. Zek looked in the direction the robot had come from. Burtz stood there, his face bloody. His right leg was a shredded, shattered mess, but still he stood. He shot Zek a thumbs up. Is that all? said Jot. He'd removed what remained of his mask. He was shockingly young. He couldn't have been much older than Matthew and Stephen. His face was a stone, but his eyes betrayed his fear. The tactical silk cowl that formed the rest of his helmet was torn to shreds. Bloody mats of hair stuck through. Is that all of them? He repeated. How many are there? He was answered by a muffled thump from close behind. The soldier he'd wrapped with his spider gun still lay supine, but he was no longer wriggling in his web sack. Another thump. The web sack stretched, then sprang back. Purple smoke oozed through the strands. We have to get it to the fire, said Zek. I'm out of bombs. Burtz couldn't walk, so he dropped to his belly and started crawling toward the sack. Zek rushed in and grabbed one end of it. Jot and I will get it, Zek said to Burtz. Captain Jot hesitated. Come on, said Zek. We don't know how long this is going to hold. W what if it jumps out while we're holding it, said Jot. He was trembling where he stood. Zek realized that the guard was terrified. He started dragging the web sack toward the fire on his own. The chest cavity thumped and expanded and retracted. The fire was twenty feet away. Zek's boot heel slipped on the smooth surface of the lava. He fell on his ass, the web sack in his lap. The sack burst open. A round body surrounded by twenty arms flung itself at his face. Zek had no time to react. In a second, the squid would wrap itself around his unprotected head. Then, in midair, it changed direction. The legs popped off and clattered to the ground. The shell of the robot cracked open, and a small wisp of purple wafted out. Something tiny screamed in pain. Zek looked behind him to see Captain Tamor standing there, acoustic laser in hand. Her left arm had been stripped of armor, her forearm bent where it should have been straight. Thanks, said Zek. Thanks for helping Bob. Bob? Captain Jot. She holstered the acoustic laser. Speaking of? Bob, you're injured. It's just scratches, he said, feeling his scalp. He peeled back his cowl. He was still shaking. 
M my mask. It's shattered. Captain Tamor took off her own mask and pulled her cowl back. Take mine, she said. The cowl we can patch. She may have been in her early thirties, but it was difficult to tell. Her hair was jet black and cut short. Her face carried numerous scars, most small, a few large. Her eyes looked like they'd seen eons. What'll you wear? said Bob, taking Tamor's mask from her. We'll worry about it later, she said. Thank you, Cheryl, said Bob. He looked down at the mask but didn't put it on. Meat, said Bertz, still on the ground but sitting up now. Where is he? I destroyed the squids that were carting him off, but he's much too heavy for me to haul back here alone. He's still out cold. She looked at his leg. You need medical attention. I'm shocked you're not bleeding more. We have Medigel in the wagon. Save it, Bert said. I make my own version. Nanobots in the blood, from Wolf Labs themselves. I'll heal soon enough. Sure enough, his lacerations were closing up like slow zippers. His blood was red, but had a strange silver sheen to it. I'll be fine once I eat something. You could use some first aid, though. He nodded at her arm. In a minute. We need to see if one of these things is still alive. Maybe we can get some information out of it. She knelt down and picked through the wreckage of the most recently destroyed robot. When she stood, she cradled in her hand a writhing pink creature that almost looked like a human baby, if that baby was a scrawny old man. What the hell is that? said Bob. It's a homunculus, cloned from the flesh of a man named Plumwine. That purple fog that came out of the suits is Plumwine's animus. He breathes life into the empty suits, but he needs these things to control them. We are not things, said the homunculus in a voice that squeaked and wheezed. We are the children of Lord Plumwine. We will have our quarry. Are there more of you, said Tamor, more Numa in the area? The homunculus coughed. It matters not, it said. It is too late for you. Any moment now, the Arterians will launch a coordinated attack. He coughed and hacked. An attack on all of your orbital weapon arrays, all of your communication satellites, and all of your... Cough, cough. Military posts. You have already lost a war. You did not even know had begun. The wind whipped up. A low hum quickly turned to a rumble that vibrated the very atmosphere. A bright purple glow rose from behind a hill in the distance. In an instant, it was overhead. An Arterian hovercraft. We have used our time in exile to build an army the churls cannot possibly defeat. Regard the wreckage here. You have destroyed nothing but empty suits. He coughed so hard he spit up a glob of purple goop that might have been blood. Lord Plumwine has many children, and we are all eager to give our lives for the greatness of Arteria. Churlia is small. Your forces are stretched thin as it is. Your alliances tenuous. Even as I speak, Plumwine's army is defeating the Churlian Tephra on every corner of the globe. Your greatest fighters crushed like ants. He trailed off into a coughing fit. You talk an awful lot for something that chokes on fresh air, said Tamor. The homunculus gasped for breath between coughs. Between gasps, it almost sounded like it was laughing. A wide beam of light, the color of lavender, reached down from the hovercraft. It engulfed Meat Rom's body, a spotlight for a sleeping giant on a hilltop. No, said Bertz. Stop them! He began to crawl toward the light. Meat Rom's body started to ascend, slowly but steadily. Welcome back. I'm David Jewell. You're listening to Radio Cataclysm, 
an audiobook podcast bringing you stories from the Zek universe and beyond. If you want to go down kind of a weird rabbit hole, do yourself a favor, or whatever the opposite of a favor is, and read about the history of the homunculus. So generally defined, the word basically just refers to a small representation of a human, uh, which is how Cheryl uses it when she talks about Plumwine's clones. Those are small representations of Lord Plumwine himself. But the word actually has its origins in alchemy, and it was also central to something called the preformationist theory, which I won't get into too deeply here, but essentially there used to be people, and maybe there still are, who believed that inside every sperm cell there was a tiny little person. And when conception happened, that tiny little person would just start growing into the person they would eventually uh, grow up as. You know, clearly not true for a number of reasons, um, but you know, there were people who took this seriously. I'm not here to argue with 18th century scientists, I just think it raises more questions than it answers. Questions for another day. Hey, if you want to hear next week's episode early, you can subscribe on Patreon at patreon.com slash radiocataclysm. You can also find the text version of this story serialized at whatnotetc.com. That's whatnotetc.com. And of course, you'll find the text version a week early over at the Patreon as well. Patreon is also where you'll find side stories, a peek behind the scenes, and other exclusive content. Tonight's sound is... Until next time, this is Radio Cataclysm. It's not the end of the world.